Hello, everybody. This is InventRight co-founder Andrew Kraus. This is InventRight co-founder Andrew Krauss. Okay, got an audio issue there. Hold on a moment. I think I'm broadcasting the same feed. Just one moment. Broadcasting the same feed. Just one moment. <laughs> I had my feed open in another browser. Hold on a second. Okay. Close tabs. Getting off to a good start. Okay, there we go. Fixed. All right. Um, Madeline, sound good now? Now they got rid of the echo. <laughs> I'm not listen. I don't need to listen to my, my self talk. There we go. All right, we're good to go, guys. I want to welcome everybody. My name is uh, InventRight. Uh, my name is InventRight. <laughs> my name is Andrew Kraus, and I co-founded InventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago. And we've been coaching and mentoring inventors to license their products ever since. Um, you know, I've been doing these Q and A's. Uh, Madeline, I think is this the sixth one? I believe this is the sixth one. Um, and we've been doing this for six weeks now. We've been doing InventRight for 20 years. But um, I want to start off with just talking about the, the basics. And then you guys got a bunch of questions already. I'm just going to jump in and, and answer those. But for those of you that are brand new, I want to talk about what the basics of what licensing is. And uh, just really, really briefly, um, you know, you have, you have two main paths you can go down when you have an invention. You can make it and sell it yourself. Fancy way of saying make it and sell it yourself is called venturing. You start a business, you're going to manufacture it, you're going to sell it yourself. That can be incredibly difficult. The downsides of that path, there is no wrong or right path here, okay? It's what's right for you. But I found that for most inventors, um, starting your own business, you know, if you've got a job, if you've got a business that you run, you cannot launch a product on any serious level. Um, with a full-time job or a business. It requires 60 to 80 hour work weeks. It requires a lot of money. Um, so my business partner, Stephen Key, who's also the co-founder of InventRight, uh, he did nothing but license his whole life. But he did these little guitar picks. They were in the shape of Mickey Mouse and skulls. And it actually he actually changed the shape of the guitar pick. And for for, for that product, that was a product that was manufactured for six cents a piece. And they came in a three pack. And they sold for $2.99. So on a six-cent product, I guess it's an 18-cent product if it's three of them together, um, they started that, him, him and a couple of his friends started that business with $200,000. And it wasn't remotely enough on a six-cent product. So you can imagine if you got a $59 product, if you got a $29 product, you got a $10 product, you need a lot of money to launch a new product. Um, now, also, retailers don't like one SKU, one product companies. You know, you're not well funded. They know you don't know what you're doing. They're worried you're not going to deliver in time. And I hate to say it, but the buyer at Bed Bath & Beyond or Walmart or Target or Home Depot, they'd rather deal with that company that's got five, six, 10, 20, 50, 100 products. You know, they don't want to deal with the one SKU, one product company. Just imagine if the buyer at Bed Bath & Beyond, every single product in their store had a different vendor. They'd shoot themselves in the head and go, oh my God, this is such a this is such a nightmare. So, but when you license to that big company, you are that big company. And not only can they get it in the stores where they already are, because they have those relationships, but more importantly, they can keep it there. So when they're thinking about kicking your product to the curb, they can say, oh, well, no, we'll give you discounts on these others. And oh, but I got this other product. They, they're going to maintain those relationships. It's very hard for a small company with one product to get the face time from the buyers at the stores or if it's an industrial product with those buyers to maintain that relationship and keep it in the store. So with venturing, you need to raise tons of money. And I grew up in Silicon Valley, so I call it venture or vulture capital. You know, the money people aren't typically very nice people and they, they'll, they'll own your company. You don't really own it anymore when they give you all that money. And they'll expect you to put your money in too. So now you're mortgaging your house and home. You're risking a lot. And really, my biased viewpoint is it's very rare that you can be successful with one product. If you work your butt off to get retail distribution, you're going to need to come up with other products to feed those retailers because they're not going to take you seriously if you just have one product for a long period of time. If you fight tooth and nail to get into that retailer, you've got to come up with other products to stay in that retailer. 
You really do. So now, but when you license, you know, they already have 50 products. They take that that manufacturer's rep very seriously. So when you're venturing, you raise tons of money, you need 60, 80 hour work weeks to get started. You're not gonna like spend 20 hours a week and start a company or even 40. Um, and it's really, really hard to get distribution. Um, with that said, I admire people that start their own business. It's amazing. Uh, I admire that. But with licensing, you're putting all that money off onto them. So they're risking all their money. So you don't have to risk your money. You spend a lot of our students, once they get, get to know our approach, they're literally spending $70 on a provisional patent, a few bucks on a sell sheet, maybe a virtual prototype, maybe so you cannibalize down at the store and you're in the game. So you can, I've always said this, and I think I said this in some of the other chats, you can have delusions of grandeur when you're licensing and you are not delusional. So a lot of you have really big, really a, you have really big goals for your invention. And when you license it to that big company, they could sell 20,000 or 50,000 or half a million units. It depends on the type of product, of course. And that's not craziness for them. And they have unlimited money. They have a line of credit you know, with the bank. And for, any, for a company that's been around a while, they have unlimited money for a product that sells well. They will never run out of money, okay? Most companies of any decent size. And they're, and I like to think that they're doing the work for you. So it's their sales, marketing, manufacturing, advertising. They're all working for you because once you license it to them, you step aside, you work on licensing other products. Now, you might they might want to help with this or that with some new iteration or something. But for the most part, they're going to do all the work. Um, so it's an amazing, licensing is an amazing path. So I don't want to ramble too much on that because I see you got a ton of questions here. So let me go to my other monitor here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. let me move this over so I can see it. Okay. First question. Michael says, hello, Andrew, received a full utility patent for an auto snow removal device. It's required, it required the same injection molding process as PVC buckets. Okay. Um, should I pitch to them or snow removal companies? The snow removal companies, man, you don't, you, that's the whole thing about licensing. You're tapping into what's already there. You're tapping into their existing distribution. So his product is an auto snow removal device. Now he says it's the same, he's probably maybe somewhat engineering oriented, as, as same injection molding process as PVC buckets, as buckets. But if the people that are selling buckets don't have distribution where people are selling snow removal devices more than likely. So you're asking them to sell um, snow removal equipment when they really sell PVC buckets. Now, if if it's, I could see it. Let's so we don't know what Michael's product is and he hasn't disclosed any specifics, but let's say he's invented this um, snow removal device, but you use it by hand and you use it to shovel your driveway from snow, but by hand, and it's kind of a bucket. That sounds like backbreaking. I know that's not what your idea is, Michael, but let's say it is. Well, in that case, maybe approaching the buckets, guys, if if somebody would buy the snow removal device in the same shelf at Home Depot, that might make sense. But if that's not where they're going to buy this sort of device, then it doesn't make sense. So you only want to approach companies that have distribution where you already want to be. You you can't ask companies, oh, this is a good idea. You should sell in these stores and these. No, they're going to sell wherever the frick they sell now. They're going to, I said that to get your guys' attention. It's not a swear word, by the way. They're going to sell wherever the heck they sell now. They're not, you're not going to ask them to change their whole business. The whole entire point of licensing is tapping into the money and the existing distribution and the workforce. So if they're already in the places you want to be, those are the companies you want to contact. So, you know, if if the answer is that the people that are making PVC buckets are selling in those places where they might buy this snow removal device, yes. But if it's not, you're asking them to do something completely different. And, you know, if they're just selling buckets, yeah, it's, it's a little different if you're saying snow removal. And they're like, we don't do snow removal. We make buckets, you know, but you might you might make that stretch without knowing your product michael i can't know specifically but tap into existing distribution don't tell them to create new distribution channels don't tell them i mean i i had somebody the other day tell me like well um 
I want this each individual product to be monogrammed with that person, like individual orders. I'm like, okay, you can approach companies that do that. But if a company is selling mass market at Walmart, they're not going to do one-off orders to customers on the web. That's too different. So find companies that have distribution where you want to be. They can be doing something slightly different. They're doing buckets, but now it's a, a different you know, collection device. So you can spread it out a little bit and expand it. Now I'll go the other direction. Sometimes people feel like, oh, I can only contact companies that are making more or less the exact same thing. Don't do that either. That's wrong as well. Okay. So um, next one's from Brian. Sometimes I get too in depth of answers on some of these. Um, so I'm going to try to answer as many of your questions. You know, I got an email from somebody, I forget what he was. And I had I only got one, guys. And and he said an email to me and said, um, you know, I'm gonna be on the YouTube QA and don't um don't ignore my questions because these are important questions. I'm like, dude, I can't answer. We get so many questions, I can't answer every single one. And if I'm not if I'm not somewhat specific, though span enough, then you guys aren't learning. So I only got one. Everybody else has been great, but it's like, dude, I'm not ignoring you. I can't answer every question in an hour. Um, and I, I should have remembered what his name is. And if you're listening, I apologize if I don't answer your question. You can actually, actually what we'll do here, if that was you, type in that, well, now some, now some of you guys are going to cheat and say it was you. <laughs> but if that was you, and I only see one, Madeline will screen it, then Madeline, please put that in the queue so I can, I can ask that. Um, hello, Andrew. I have a few questions from Brian. Regarding the PPA, question number one, can you use black and white photo instead of a line drawing if you already have a product? There are absolutely no formal requirements for PPA, guys. You can include color photos. You could include black and white photos. You can include line drawings you did. You could you could include drawings if you – nobody mails them in anymore, but um, you know most people send them in electronically. But you could draw it in freaking crayon. I think frickin's my word tonight, but you can draw it in crayon and they will always accept it. Okay. Nobody is reviewing it. Nobody is looking at it. And that used people say, oh, I got my provisional patent granted. No, you didn't get anything granted. You sent it in, you established that date. If anybody needs to go back, they'll look at it and go, did he cover it? Didn't he? But when they accept it, it's always accepted. You could put the most ridiculous stuff in there. Now, the reason why PPAs get rejected sometimes is you didn't fill out the, the form right. You didn't put your name or your address or you didn't pay your fees, but it will always be accepted. And you can absolutely use black and white photos. Um, now, there are two... The things that are important with regards to um, sending in your provisional patent. There's two different people you need to make happy, and it's not going to be what you guys think. So one is you got to do it right so that if ever if it ever gets reviewed, if you ever connect your patent, if you file a full utility later and reference the provisional, that you did a good job. Okay, that's one reason why you want to do a decent job with your PPA. But the more important reason why you want to do a good job with your PPA is not what you think. It's when you send it to that marketing person at the company that's interested and it doesn't look like it was done by a kindergartner. So you don't do it in crayon. And one of the things that we teach our students is to do line drawings. Now, you know, if you ever looked at a patent, a full patent, not a provisional, the, the drawings that are in patents, it has to be done very specifically. You guys should not be doing that. You should always get a professional patent drafter to do that. But with a PPA, there is no requirements. But the benefit of doing line drawings is you kind of make them look like patent drawings. Don't go to a professional patent drafter. Go to somebody that does line drawings. And usually those are pretty cheaply done. And sometimes what you can do is you can take a, a picture of your product, put it um, on, on a glass table put a lamp underneath it and then put some paper on top of it and then trace it. So like I can barely draw a stick figure. It was one of my goals is to learn to draw one of these days. Um, my, my daughter who's getting close to turning eight, I, my God, like within like six months, I saw her handwriting go from eh, to like better than mine and she's eighth grader. So, um, but so, but what I'm saying is you could even, not be able to do very good line drawings. And by putting the, a picture of it, it could be something you printed up on your printer, 
on a glass coffee table, shining a light up through it, then putting a piece of paper on top of that. You could trace. You could actually make decent line drawings that way, or you can pay somebody to do those line drawings. But so getting back to what I'm saying is the person that you want to impress is the marketing people because they don't really know what a good patent, provisional patent is or isn't. But if the drawings look really crude, um, it can create a good impression if they look like patent drawings, even though it doesn't have to be specifically like patent drawings. So it's just this perceived look. But um, yeah, you can include black and white photos, color photos, what have you um, in there. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to jump on to Joseph's question. Can you license a product with just a trademark? Yeah, you know, one of our students did that by accident. So, and this isn't typical because I can't remember another case where this happened, but the, the company was not interested in their product, but they really liked the trademark and they licensed the trademark. It was very odd. Um, but yes, not only that, you can license it without a trademark or a patent or anything. So our students do deals all the time where the company's like, they filed a provisional, but the company's like, we don't care about patents. You know, if you want to file it, you can, but we'll pay you a royalty. It's the contract that says they need to pay you. And if it doesn't stipulate that they, that it's dependent on a patent, once they sign that contract, they got to pay you regardless, you know, if you set it up right. So um, yeah, you can absolutely license the product just with a trademark, but I really, we always advise our students to file a provisional patent. It might mean that you have next to no protection. It's not really patentable, but it creates this perception, this aura of, of professionalism, and it only costs you $70. Our students use our smart IP software, and then you only pay the patent office fee of 70 bucks. Um, so, uh, you can absolutely license a product with just a trademark or not a trademark at all. Most for the most part, and again, this is not legal advice. I want to give this disclaimer. This is just, we're giving business advice, consult your attorney. If you need legal advice, this is not legal advice, but a lot of our students, um, you know, they don't file trademarks. You don't want to spend all that money. You know, that costs a fair chunk of change. And a good percentage of the time, they aren't interested in the name, but they love the product and they want to rename it to something else. So don't be that finicky inventor that's so attached to the name. That's a red flag. You start talking to them and they sense you're like, just, oh my God, there's no way I'm going to change this name. That can kill a licensing deal like you wouldn't believe. Or if they want to make it pink and you're like, oh no, it has to be purple. You know, be careful about that. Don't do that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, getting back to the trademark thing, you can file a con you can do a common law trademark. It's like copyright. It's automatic. So you can just put the name of the product and put that little circle with the TM. The TM is a common law trademark. You don't need to do anything. You just put the circle around it, just like copyright. You put TM. You're putting them on notice. Hey, this is my this is my trademark. And to go out and spend to get the R with the circle around it, the registered trademark, it's you know it could bite you in the butt. But if every one of our students filed the trademark, most of the time you're going to get bit in the butt by spending that money and it wasn't money you need to spend. Again, not legal advice, just common sense advice because a good percentage of the time they don't want the trademark that you're using. They want the product and they want to change the name. Um, so John is the next one. Um, I'm European and can't do a PPA for my country. I understand PPAs can be done through the U.S., but does that give enough perceived ownership so that I would actually have anything to negotiate with? Absolutely. We have had students in, I know it sounds impressive, guys. We've had students in over 65 countries in the last 20 years. But, you know, some of those are like, it's some like po French Polynesian island. And that's, that counts as a country. Um, but I am very proud of that, that we've helped people from all around the world. So, uh, and we tell our students from around the world, just file a U.S. provisional patent application. They don't care. It's irrelevant where you're from. If you're from Europe or if you're from Kathmandu or if you're from Australia or if you're from Asia, it, there's no discrimination in the U.S. And some other countries, they make it harder for foreign inventors. But in, in the U.S., it, there's no difference between an American from California filing a provisional U.S. patent or uh, a European filing it. It offers you the same measure of protection. So it's really a relevant question. Now, what I'll also say is that um, 
our students do deals with companies from around the world, but the vast majority of the deals that our students do are with U.S. and Canadian companies and European on on the I was a, I said as a third. Um, it's very rare you're going to be doing a deal with an Asian company. Um, a lot of these countries, they they don't really respect intellectual property. A lot of Asian countries. Um, now we I got I had a deal that a comp, uh, we had a student. He was an Israeli student, and he did a deal with a Chinese company that makes toilets for an entire toilet, which is crazy. Like if he just came to me early on, I'm like, this is going to be a tough one, but he did it and we guided him through it. But this Chinese company already had distribution and was selling toilets in Home Depot, which is a major US retailer, John. So, um, and but for the most part, you don't see a lot of Chinese companies with the, this gets changing, but it's still not so much. They're usually, they're an American company, they're a Canadian company, they're a European company, an Australian company, and they may be getting manufactured in China, but you're licensing to that American, Canadian, European, or Australian company. It doesn't matter where they're getting it made. But my point is that in the U.S., we've got this sense of entrepreneurial nature about us, and and they don't care. They're not asking you for your resume or show us your portfolio. These are two times that I know of, there might've been a few more, where any company asks the inventor, what have you done before? Show us your portfolio. I want to know who you are. They don't do that. They just care about what you're showing them right now. You know. So most of our students are licensing to US and Canadian companies, and then sometimes European companies. Do not limit yourself to Europe, John, because you're European. Um, I'll say this straight up. Europe, in Europe, it's still, in Australia, this is what they call it. I learned from my Australian students. They call it the tall poppy syndrome. So you're a tall po poppy is a flower and it grows too high and they cut you down. So it's a tall poppy syndrome. So, you know, you, you might get a response if you call an Australian, but well, who are you? You know, you're just an individual. You're not, and this is what a lot of inventors think is common. You got to have this website and be pound on your chest and go, this is who I am. And you got to be really impressive in all aspects. No, you just have to have a good sell sheet. You just need to pick up the phone or, or contact them on LinkedIn. You don't need to do that. And American companies and Canadian companies, they just want what you're showing them. Now, European companies, not really bad, but it's a little bit worse, a little bit. Um, it's a little bit harder to close a deal because they're still a little snooty. Like, well, who are you? You're not another company. Now, we, we have a lot of students that have done deals with European companies. But, John, don't restrict yourself to whatever country you're in Europe or Europe altogether. You know, reach, see if you can license that product to, to American companies. Now, let's say it's an American company or it's a European company. Uh, let me clarify. There are European companies that are very strong and have strong distribution in the U.S. I would qualify them as a US type company because they have distribution in the US market. So let me qualify that. So it's not European companies, it's companies that sell exclusively in Europe and not in the US, okay? That's that's important delineation. Um, so if you have a US provisional, let's say this, this uh, let's say it's a American company and they sell 80% of their product in the US and 20% in Europe, they probably don't care about European patents. Even they don't wanna spend the money on them. They're like, we got great distribution, we don't care, we're not gonna spend a bunch of money on European patents. I know that may shock some of you, but it's true. Um, so let's see, what's next? Uh, let's see, I wanna to try to get to people that I haven't gotten to before. Uh, ben says, for some ideas, I struggle to decide if I should try sending it to DRTV companies or sending it to multiple companies in that industry. Do you have any tips for helping to make that determination? You know, so DRTV is the infomercials guys, you know, the advertisements on TV. And in the U.S., the vast majority of those sales are not people that pick up the phone and call. They see it on TV, they become familiar, and they're going through a big box store with their shopping cart. And they're like, oh, I saw that on TV. I know what that is. They throw it in their cart. And they're like, hey, if it sucks, I'll just return it. That wasn't like that back in the day. And back in the day, that you'd order from the 800 number. And then if you tried to return it, they would give you a hard time. They'd make you jump through lots of hoops. DRTV business has changed a lot. 
Um, so sometimes you have been, um, you'll have a, for a product, you'll be like, oh, this could be a DRTV infomercial product, but it could also be just a product that shows up on the store shelves. It doesn't necessarily require all the illustration and how it works, but it would be good for DRTV. So you'd have a list of DRTV companies and then regular companies. And it, only for DRTV do I suggest this. I would approach the DRTV guys first, one at a time, and then approach the other companies if you're not successful with DRTV. Um, for any other industry besides DRTV, it's like a shotgun blast. You just get it out there to everybody. Do, don't do one at a time. You'll drive yourself insane that way. It'll take forever. Because if you have to wait all this time for this one company to get back to you, and then you do one more and one more, you get it out to everybody. Okay. Um, uh, Duran says, what are good marketing material examples? Um, I don't have sell sheets like right here that I could hold up. I think we've done some videos with sell sheet reviews. So if you type in sell sheets into our InventRight YouTube channel, Duran, you could probably find some examples of bad sell sheets, good sell sheets. Um, and I think, you know, if you go on our design studio, we do sell sheets for people. You might find some samples there as well. So if you go to inventright.com, then you go to our design studio. Um, Okay, Todd says, my PPA will expire in two months. I have improvements for it that make it operate differently with other parts. Can I add these different operations into the PPA? How different before the new PPA? So I'm gonna save you guys some time and patent attorneys probably won't like that I'm saying this, but patent attorneys aren't always truthful with you. I get inventors that um, the good ones are. There's good patent attorneys. There's actually a list of inventor-friendly patent attorneys on InventRight. Um, but they're not always truthful with you. And this is what happens. People worry, they file a provisional and they haven't made any public disclosure. It's about public disclosure. So if you haven't put it up on a website, haven't sold it at a swap meet, whatever, most inventors haven't shown it to anybody. And if you've privately showed it to potential licensees, it's not considered public disclosure. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, they, 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 they you know, you file a provisional, you're like, oh, this is cool. You know, there's this thing called a provisional and I can file it and I can get protection for an entire year. But here's what happens. You file it, you don't know how to license, you don't know how to make your sell sheet, you don't know how to make your list of companies, you're afraid of reaching out to companies, you're afraid of so many things, and then your year runs out. But here's what happens. So it's exactly where you are, Todd. Two months before it runs out, you go to an attorney and they're like, well, if you want to preserve your um, your your filing right, if you want to preserve, how do they say it normally? I forget, I, I'm drawing a blank there, but if you want to preserve your, your filing rights, they give you the impression that if you don't file a full utility, you'll, you'll lose your rights. And that's not true. Now, you'll lose the right to that date from 10 months ago when you filed the provisional, but you could take that exact same provisional, Todd, file it today, and you'll get a year from today. So every time you file a provisional, it's separate. They're not connected in any way. The only way a provisional is connected is if you file it, and then within a year, you file a full utility, and then you reference the provisional, okay? But if you haven't shown it to anybody, Todd, even if you've shown it to people, but you haven't made public disclosure, you haven't put it on a website, or sold it at a swap meet every weekend for a year or something like that, then you can file that same provisional again. And what attorneys do is they get people signed up for 10 grand thinking the inventor thinking they're gonna lose their rights, but they're not they're not saying to the inventor almost ever, the good ones will, you can just file that provisional again. You know, now your question was, um, I can I add these? You can add anything you want to it, Todd. So you file that provisional and you can't add to that original provisional. So whatever you filed in provisional number one 10 months ago, that's it. Your date from 10 months ago, you're protected for that stuff until 12 months, okay? And then you're not. But if you file that same provisional, take the same one and it has A and B in it, and now you add C, and you file it today, you're protected a year from today. So yeah, you can keep filing provisions if you don't make public disclosure, okay? You keep filing provisionals forever, but what's the point of that? So I always tell our students, 
file the provisional the week before you're ready to call. You got your cell, you did all your research, you got your sell sheet or your video sell sheet, you got your list of 30 companies or whatever it is, and you're gonna start reaching out. Now you file the provisional, now you got a whole year. Using the event right approach, our students never need a year. You know if there's interest in three months and maybe some, let's say it's a difficult negotiation and it drags six months, you still have three months left. OK, so that's why you want to do that. So you can just add whatever you want to it. It doesn't have to be different, Todd. That was your question. You could file the same provisional again, but you've got stuff you want to add. So this is a great opportunity to add it. And don't keep going back to your attorney. I mean, you can file it on your own for 70 bucks, you know. But anyway, again, not legal advice. Consult your attorney before you move forward. I have to keep giving that disclaimer. Um, uh, uh, John, I already answered a question, so I want to go through some people I didn't answer. Um, boy, what's all with all these patent questions, guys? Uh, okay, uh, this is a good new one. Tyler, uh, which number should I use for cold calling? All I'm finding is a customer service number. So you want to find the corporate number. You can call a customer service number and ask what the corporate number is. But you can also type in the website. You know, you can type in XYZ company corporate site. And then on that site, we'll have that number. So you want to call the corporate number. You can call customer service if you can't find anything and ask for the corporate number. And you'll get somebody that's like customer service oriented. Oh, but sir, what can he help you with? Because they're not used to that. And, and some of them will give you the corporate number. Some will be like, oh, no, I can help you. Do you need pro help with a product? And you say, no, that's, I'm looking to license a product. I need to talk to one of your marketing managers. And they probably don't. The customer service person probably doesn't even know what licensing is. So, But, you know, people get too put off by it not working exactly like you want. So let's say you call five different customer service um, numbers at five different companies, but only two out of the five will give you the corporate number. Well, then you get on, you Google it, you know, don't, don't think it's going to work. Ev what you try is going to work every time. You got to try a lot of different things. You got to mix it up. So the great question, Tyler. Um, okay. So Samus says how to prepare and change presenting during COVID-19 with the economic downturn, how will it change product cycle and accepting product ideas? Okay, well, all I can speak to that is I can speak to what our students are experiencing right today. I can't predict what's gonna happen a month from now, three months from now, six months from now. What we're finding, and you guys will be surprised by this, is we're finding our students are able to get into companies easier right now. Not every company, some companies are in some sort of crisis mode, especially smaller companies, but, um, People are working, these, these are marketing managers, okay? These aren't people that work on cars for a living and they're sitting at home twiddling their thumbs. They're, they're marketing managers, they're white collar, they're working from home, and we're finding they're more responsive to email and more responsive on LinkedIn, not less. And I think they're checking their email more. They're not an endless waste of time meetings. Maybe some of their meetings are productive, of course, but maybe some of them are wasted time. And they're paying more attention. And um, so we're finding that our students are able to get a hold of companies more. Also, we're not finding that the deals that our negotiation coach has with our students, Paul is our negotiation coach, that they're falling off. Um, we have just as many as we normally would have in any spring. Now, without a doubt, you're asking uh, how it will change the product cycle, some of us. Um, is it going to be an additional three, four, six, eight months before the product gets launched? Yeah, I would say in most cases, most of the time. But our students are okay with that. You know, okay, you license the product, and okay, it takes them an additional six months to get it to market because they, because they got some other things they got to put it in queue, they got to get things done. Um, but they also have um, they have budgets for new products, and the strongest companies will come out of situations like this stronger, not weaker. You know, the weak ones are like, oh, we're in crisis. You know, it's like. You know, a lot of them will come out of this stronger, not weaker. Um, I think some of the smaller companies are going to have a hard time of it, and I, I hope they they survive. Um, but for the most part, you guys are licensing to bigger companies. You're not licensing to mom and pop companies because that kind of defeats the purpose of licensing. You know, because the the whole thing about licensing is you go big and do big volume, and you license to a big company. It doesn't have to be the biggest guy on the block, but it. You, 
usually don't want to be the smallest guy on the block either. Um, but sometimes if the big guys aren't interested, a small deal is better than no deal at all. So uh, let's see. That's a great question. Um, let's see. Okay, Susan has a question. I have patents on a product to contain germs. I want to license it. Can I email, send a sell sheet to the task force health agency companies at the same time? Do they need to know all my contacts? I, I think, you know, so that's kind of what Steve and I call pull through marketing, Susan. So if you wanted to send us some agency or something, get their interest. And then, you know, they're like, oh, well, can we buy it? And you're like, well, I'm going to be licensing this. If, if it's for sale, you know, will you buy it? And they're like, hell yeah. You know, so it would, in your case, it would make sense to reach out to some agencies, see if you can get some interest. And, but that, that wouldn't be my first thing. But in addition to reaching out to companies, then you can say to the companies, look, this and this agency is showing interest. Um, now, with regards to that, I had a couple students that, were, you know, they're working on a project and they just wanted to dump what they were working on. I want to do a COVID product now. And it's like, you got to realize guys that the, the, it takes a company after you license it, uh, you know, three, three months to a year to launch the product, you know, and then you get paid your royalties quarterly every three months. So don't think you can approach a company and like two weeks from now they're selling it because this is so urgent. You know, you've seen the ability of companies just to keep up. What makes you think they can launch a product that quick? I've had some inventors on a similar note, related note, um, tell me they showed a product to a company and then three weeks later they saw it on the market and they think they stole it. I'm like, what are you thinking? Like what company can launch a product in three weeks? That I guarantee you that company did not steal your idea if you only showed it to them three weeks ago. Um, and it's the same thing. Do not expect them, Susan, to launch this. But on that note, people are going to be concerned about germs and staying healthy and these types of viruses for a long time to come. So don't think of it as a get-rich-quick scheme. Think of it as a long-term play. Um, and that's fine. Okay, but don't think you're going to make a million dollars overnight and they're going to be selling the product in two weeks. That's unreal. I've talked to a few students to, to get them more real about that. Um, uh, Renee says, if you get interest in a product after your provisional is expired, should you refile the PPA or initiate a non-provisional to keep it protected? So, you know, privately with the American Events Act many, many years ago, um, privately showing your product for license is not considered public disclosure. So, and again, patent attorneys don't tell you this, guys. Yeah, you're going to lose the original date from your original provisional, but you could file a new provisional and you'll get protection from that date. Again, if you make public disclosure, you're toast. And a public disclosure is putting it up, not an unlisted YouTube video, but a public YouTube video, selling it as a swap meet or anything like that. That is considered public disclosure. But if you privately showed it to five companies or 10 companies, you could, you could file that provisional patent. And that, in most cases, is what makes sense for most of our students. Now, if it's a, a particularly um, difficult, so that could bite you in the butt. In 20 years, it hasn't bit one of our students in the butt, but it could. So where could it bite you in the butt? Well, with a really, really, um, really difficult industry where they will try to figure out a way around you, which there really aren't many, but the packaging industry is one of those. There's a, there's a lot of money to be made in packaging. Packaging is like a toothpaste tube, a package of product goes in where they're selling like bazillions of units, not literally, but you get the idea. Um, you know, they they will they will try to figure out a way around you. So let's say you're in a negotiation. They're aware your provisional expired, you know, and now you, and you really need to maintain that filing date. But you know, most companies they're not going to like try to get around you. You know, they just aren't. Um, in the 20 years we've been doing this, I don't know of one of our students that has been knocked off by a company they presented to. And because it's a lot of liability, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. But there are certain industries, a few that, and, and I would say packaging is one of them, where which all the more reason why, Renee, 
you want to file the provisional the, the day or the week before you're ready to start calling. So you get the whole year. Now, if you don't have the training that we give our students, you know, and you're being very slow about it, you know, and you wait until 10 months in to even call a single company, well, now you're not utilizing all that time it gave you, but um, that the provisional gave you. So, so it could bite you in the butt, but our students do it all the time. They refile their provisional and they keep contacting companies. But here's the, here's the deal. If you haven't licensed it within a year, you're probably done with the product. You know, now I always tell our students like, look, if they're, if they're, if you call 25 companies and they give you non-specific no's, well, not at this time, really interesting, but not a right match for us. These are generic answers, which you get a lot of, and you still really believe in the product. You can pull that out six months later and email all the same companies. I get students licensed all the time that way. And I only started giving that advice about six years ago. And the reason why I gave the advice is I would get students that were really upset they didn't license their first product. And I was trying to get them to stop being upset and let's move on to the next project. And I said it as a getaway of getting them to move on. Look, if you really believe in it, just re-email to all the same companies, maybe some new companies six months later. And people started licensing products that way. We did, haven't been giving that advice for 20 years. We're like, well, I called 25 companies. There's no interest. If you believe in it, do it. And in that case, you might want to file the provisional again. And you have the right to do that if you haven't made a public disclosure and you can, you'll be protected. Another thing that you can do is, let's say you had make a public disclosure and you have A and B in it and you file a provisional, then it expires. You can always file a provisional on C. So it's some new feature. So you can't protect what's been publicly disclosed for over a year, but you could protect some new feature. And they don't know what you have in your provisional or not, so you're showing them the whole product, and you're saying legally patent pending. You don't have to say provisional patent pending. And they're showing interest. You're getting them wrapped up in it. You're talking about it. You're not going to show your provisional patent first thing. Hell no. you show that later. And, and most companies aren't intellectual, aren't patent obsessed. Some are. It ranges from we could care less about patents to we, we're, we're only going to pay you royalties if you get these certain claims. That's few and far between, but it does happen. To the ones that are in between, ah, we want the window dressing. We know patents aren't the be-all, end-all of protection, but we want to be able to say patented or patent pending. So thank you, Susan. Great question. Oh, no, that wasn't from Susan. That was from Renee. Sorry. Gave Susan credit there. Um, your question was good too, Susan. <laughs> um, we got about 17 minutes left. Um, should I wait? Uh, push. Well, that's interesting. One of our students has a product called Push and Hang, um, and that's their handle, Push and Hang. Andrew, should I rush out to file a PPA or should I wait until you are a little farther along as a year goes by rather quickly during your product development? Well, yeah, don't rush out to file the PPA. Now, again, consult your patent attorney for legal advice. This is not legal advice. So what could happen there? So there's the could-haves, and then there's the reality, what I've seen over 20 years of doing this. Um, so people want to get, I came up with this idea. I want to protect it from this date. But, you know, being practical, so you don't need to spend the 10 grand on the patent, you know, you could wait and you could go, okay, I'm going to get my sell sheet together. I'm going to get my list of companies together. And then I'm going to file a provisional the week before I'm ready to start calling. Now, could somebody come up with um, that idea before and then they their provisional predates yours? Yeah. Well, in that case, if you're filing your own provisional, you could still file a provisional the day you came up with it. It's, if you're filing it yourself, it's only – see, there's a difference here. If you're going and spending two, three grand with a patent attorney filing a provisional, that's different than you spending 70 bucks. So you could file that provisional the day you came up with it and go, you know, I just think somebody else might come up with it. You could do that. And then eight months later, ten months later, you're like, oh, I'm finally ready to start calling, and I'll file another provisional today. Now, they're each separate. They each give you a year from the date you file them. They're not connected in any way. Provisionals don't work that way. So if you really wanted to be conservative, I wouldn't say it's conservative. To me, I would say it's a waste of money because it's so unlikely somebody else will come up with it. But if you're paranoid about it, which if that if $70 and making the effort to do that, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, 
So you could, you could still file a provisional day you came up with it, file another one again. So that will extend your date out because eventually that, that provisional is going to run out, that first one that's a year. But what's the point of filing provisionals if you're not going to contact companies because you don't know how? I know you probably haven't heard a lot of people say that, but what's the point? It's just, it's just, oh, I feel good about myself, but then, you know, and then some attorney takes advantage of you and charges you 10 grand because they're like, you know, you're going to lose your filing date. You're going to lose your original date from that provisional. And they're right, but they don't tell you that you could file a provisional and then it's very low risk to file the same provisional again. There is a risk though, um, but it's very low risk. The higher risk is that you blow a bunch of money and then you don't have enough money to move on to your next idea. And at InventRight, we're all about teaching you an approach that you can license products the rest of your life so you don't mortgage your house and home and your spouse isn't like, damn, you spent 10 grand on that patent and five grand on that prototype. You ain't doing that again. And you're like, oh, you know, um, so, you know, it's, it's just you don't need to spend money. You don't need to spend. And people get a false sense of moving forward by spending money on patents and prototypes. And it truly is a false sense. I'm not saying you don't do those things. I'm just saying you're just giving money to people to do stuff. And you're not doing anything when you should be doing your research and all that first. So that's why huge numbers of patents. I've heard up to 80% of patents are weak to garbage because everybody just runs out and files a patent. They haven't thought it through. you know. And, they, and most people, they file patents. They never really make any serious effort. They call one or two companies or none. And they think somebody's going to call them, see their patent and go, that's a great idea. I want to license that from you. Oh my God, no. Ain't going to ever happen. Um, or they want to put their product on some website where inventors list their products and think some inventor is, is some company is going to go see your product and go, oh, I want to buy that. You got to reach out to the companies. You got to do that. Um, yeah, Nicole says, I like her thinking. I have a new product idea that's pretty simple. Can I just make a drawing? patent it and try to license it without some big expensive, expensive prototype project. Absolutely you can, Nicole. Now, I'm not saying that works for every product. You said it's pretty simple. My guess is you can. So, you know, what I'll, you know, I sound like a broken record here, but you're not selling your patent or your prototype. You're selling the benefit of your idea. So with a sell sheet or a video sell sheet, you can illustrate the benefit of your idea and get a fish on the hook, a company interested in your project. And you can cite similar products and go, well, I just changed this or change that. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty simple. We can do that. So why did you go out and spend five grand on a prototype when it wasn't necessary? Now, there are instances where it is necessary. And they'd be like, how does that even work? And you, you would need to make some sort of prototype to make it work. Maybe it's duct taped together. Maybe you need to pay somebody to engineer it. But a vast majority of our students, you don't need to make a big expensive prototype in order to license it. And it's just uh, the excuses that people make is I don't have money for a patent, so I can't move forward. I can't license my product and I don't have money for a prototype, so I can't do this. And we get rid of all of that. So you can file a $70 provisional patent, patent problem solved. You can show the benefits of your idea in a marketing piece, prototype problem solved. Companies aren't going to yell at you. Oh, you don't have a working production prototype. Well, why are you waste my time? Take a hike. They don't do that, guys. We don't get companies saying that, you know. And and even if they're like a little frustrated, if they were that you didn't have it all figured out, you you'll be now you got a fish on the hook. So now maybe if it's that type of project, we need to pay a five hundred, a thousand dollars or something to some prototype or go, hey, can you can you figure this out and then go back to them? But at least you got interest. If you don't know if there's any interest, why would you spend that money? Again. When I say these things, it's not a golden rule for every project. It's not always the same, but as a general rule that we found works, keeps your risk down and still works. We don't want, we don't teach our students to be so cheap that it will ever hurt themselves. Never. No, but, but don't spend money just to spend money. It's not, it doesn't make sense. Um, Okay, John says, I'm really interested in the product scout concept. Could you please tell me your top advice for getting started finding people with great ideas now during the pandemic? Oh, okay. So John isn't talking about, well, so here's the deal, John. I've never met a single inventor that had 
an invention promotion company license a product. I'm talking about my personal experience. But we get calls from inventors every single day. It, I got used to it. It really bothered me at the beginning. That have been taken for 10 or 12 grand. Company did nothing for them. They said, oh, we, we have the contacts. We can sell this. And there was no evidence that they had done much of anything. But the contract said, we need to submit your idea to industry, doing air quotes right now. So literally, if they made 15 minutes worth of calls in some lame ass way, they would have met their contractual obligation to the inventor. So, uh, John, if, if you want to get in the business of licensing products for inventors, you know, you're going to be a, in a sea of shysters that are claiming to help inventors that don't really help inventors. So you have to figure out how to separate yourself. And, and the best way to separate yourself is not to charge the inventor. Because um, once you start charging inventor, you know, to do it for them, you start to have to comply with a lot of Federal Trade Commission regulations. So because so many of these companies are taking advantage of inventors, the Federal Trade Commission is very strict with those sort of things. So you're, you've, you don't know what you're doing there. My advice, John, for people that ask me that is you can't represent other people until you've done it yourself. You have to do it yourself. You have to license a couple of products yourself. I don't think it's right to start representing inventors as a product scout until you um, have done it yourself. That's my take, and that's the right thing to do. And and don't don't charge for it. Just do it on a percentage. That would be the reputable way to do it. Um, well, let's see. Uh, Travis said, how does one engage companies who stayed on their website in terms of service that any submissions are effectively a release of rights? Well, don't uh, Travis, I, I talked to one of our students the other day, and there was a terms of service for the website. It was for the website, okay? So it was like, and it wasn't for the product submission part of their site. So sometimes there's such general terms of service for the website that talk, you know, in other words, like, you send them marketing copy or an idea for their website or something, and it will say that they own that, you know? And that's not the same as if I submit an invention. So if their terms of, of, of if their invention submission terms, the terms to submit the invention says so that they own your product, you know, move on to the next company. That's not common. You will see that once in a while, which is the reason why if you have a submission page on a company's site, read through the submission agreement. And I get students sometimes, they're like, you know, it's so blatant. It's like, we'll own anything you send us in perpetuity forever, royalty free. And the student asked me like, what do you think, Andrew? I'm like, it's pretty clear. <laughs> they're saying they're going to own whatever you send them. Um, so it is what it is. Don't get, now, one of the reasons why inventors get too obsessed and upset about that is because you don't know how to make your list. You don't know how to make a nice big list of, of 10, 15, 20, 30 companies. And you're focusing on just like two or three companies and you're upset that their terms of service or something, something like that. But if you realize you had a lot more companies, you wouldn't be so upset and you move on to the other ones. Okay. So um, that's my advice there. Ah, what do we got? We got seven minutes left. Um, yeah, well, Travis kind of followed up on that. His his product is a modification for locking me mechanisms like deadbolts and safes. I can't compete against such companies, so licensing is for me. But their site states the terms of service. So yeah, you know. Again, it goes back to like you can think really big when you're licensing. You can do amazing things when you're licensing. So you can like if you what he's recognizing, you must be maybe he's a, a um, locksmith or something. He's recognizing I can't compete with the likes of uh, was it Quickset or Schlag or whatever. God, I you know, and it is a little bit crazy to think and some inventors think they can do that with their one product company compete with the likes of Schlag. Good luck. You know, now I, I don't want to feel like I'm, I don't want you guys to feel like I'm beating up people that start their own companies. I admire that like you wouldn't believe, but it's not practical for most inventors. And it, you can literally go broke trying to do it. So I agree with you, Travis, in that area. Licensing is the way to go. Now, there might be um, certain locksmith type products 
um, that are more niche and you can license to a smaller company or you could start your own company. But if it's a modification for a locking mechanism for deadbolts and safes, you know, there's, there's, you'll notice that there are certain companies that dominate um, those, that industry, and you're probably going to want to license to one of them. So um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Madeline, I'm not sure if that person that had sent me that email saying, stop ignoring my questions. And I'm like, I can't answer everybody's question. Um, they say, it was only one person. You guys have been great. You've been saying great things about me helping out. I don't, I don't know if that a person's attending tonight. But if I missed it, okay. Madeline said I didn't hear from them. So maybe they're not on the night. Um, I, I want to answer as many as I can. Um, let's see if there's a few more here. I talked about this last time, but it's so important. You know, maybe some, maybe some of you weren't here last time. Um, Mike says, what is the average percentage range for a licensing deal with a major manufacturer? How can you tell what performance levels are real? Well, I answered the percentage range, and I'll just keep it brief because I did this last time, guys. You can go back and watch my other other Q and A for more details. But it's not just the percentage; it's the royalty rate, it's the price of the product, and it's the volume being sold. So people go, "Oh, we oh only five percent, or only ten percent, or something." But it all depends on what they can do. So is it a 99 cent product? Is it a $500 product? Are they gonna sell half a million units? Are they gonna sell a thousand units? You need to interview the company as to what they can do. But Mike, for a consumer product, our students do industrial, consumer, all types of products. For a consumer product, a 5% is the most common, but, and I've seen students do as much as the equivalent of a 25% deal and as little as um, one and a half percent. But again, you know, hey, if you do one and a half percent deal and they're selling eight million units a year and it's a fifty dollar product, you do the math. You know, you could do the math and you could see. So it all depends. Um, how can you tell what performance levels are real? Um, so, you know, you're going to hold you're going to interview the company about what they can do and you're going to hold them to it in the contract. That's the best way I can answer that. Um, and it's it's a. Uh, that, that is something we don't let our students handle themselves. We, our negotiation coach helps them with that because that gets a little dicey on those, those, those conversations. Um, and you need to know how to handle it. Companies get upset with us all the time, guys. And then we state it a certain way and they're like, okay, let me think on that. And they come back, well, okay, but this. It happens all the time. So that's a negotiation. It's a bit of a debate. And, um, but it works. Um, Arthur, I think we'll make this the last question. Let's say I, do have, I have an idea for a smartphone function, for example, um, as, i.e. a screenshot. How would I convey the idea to a smartphone company without having any coding experience? I, I, I've talked about this on prior calls, guys. Um, well, first off, I don't like I don't. So this is a good example, okay? So I'm not saying you don't work on that project, Arthur, but I don't like a lot of things about that idea. Not the idea, but the the metrics, if you want to call it that. So how many smartphone companies do you have? How many operating systems do you have? So you have um, Android and you have Apple, maybe one or two like insignificant others. Okay. So um, the question is, could those two, does it have to be a key feature of those operating systems or could it be an app? Could be an extra app that you add onto your phone. So now, if it's only for these two companies, that sucks, man. I, I wouldn't even bother working on a project where you only have two potential licensees. Why? You have other projects you can work on. You have 20 or 30 chances for success. Here you have two. You're going to have a ton of work, spend a bunch of money, and you have two chances. Now, if it could be an app, now you got a whole bunch of companies that sell apps, and they could sell this new smartphone function. The question is, Will the operating system let it do that? But getting back to the software, I don't recommend rookie inventors work on software ideas if you have no coding or background experience in software. Um, because the software geeks look at you and go, well, that, that's great guy, but that's going to take six guys in a room a year to program. And you can't talk intelligently. And the software geeks are a little um, skeptical of people with ideas. It's a particular thing. That, now, if you have a software background, and you have to be a programmer, and you can talk intelligently about the backend database and this and that, then I see. I think that's perfectly acceptable to work on software ideas. But a lot of you, you, you 
all of you, most of you have smartphones and you have ideas and I get that, but you're going to be a lot better off working on a dog toy or medical product or an automotive product or a gardening product or God knows pretty much anything else besides an app um, because everybody and their grandmother has an app idea and the software geeks want more than an idea. And, and I don't say that about other categories because it's not true of their categories, but it is true of software. And you do a lot more and you do some development and you spend some money. And, and our approach in event, right? Like why take all that risk? So Arthur, I'm not saying you don't work on that idea, but um, it, it has a lot of downsides, especially if it's only for Apple and Google with Android or, or the Apple operating system. Forget that. Um, people will say, well, I got this idea and I want to sell it to Google. And I'm like, okay. You know, but then you, but sometimes you look at these ideas and you recognize it could be way, it could be a lot of other companies other than Google. That happens all the time. Inventors don't know how to make their list of companies. Um, uh, Paula, we'll end on this one because we're about one minute over, but I'm not going to be that particular. Uh, Paula says, what's the easiest way to begin the patent process with little money to start? Um, well, Paula, don't begin the patent process if you don't know how to license. It's not the first thing ever. It's never, ever the first thing you do. Again, not legal advice. Contact your attorney if you want legal advice. You study the marketplace. You look at all the other products in that space. If you still think it makes sense, then you, then you make your sell sheet or your video sell sheet, your marketing piece. You're going to send to company so you don't have to be a salesperson. And then you make your list of companies. There's a lot more to it than just this, guys, but these are the basics. Then you make your list of companies. And then you file your provisional patent for $70. Um, you know, and we give our students software to do that and you don't go out and spend three grand. So, um, the question is, is you, the, are you there, Paula? Most inventors aren't. Most inventors don't have their list of companies. Most inventors don't know if they want to license or start a business themselves. So hopefully, um, for most of you listening, licensing is the better path. It's the safer path. It's that you can think huge, but you don't need to risk all your money and all you know, and, and all the risk, all the time that it takes too. I mean, you start a business, you're tied up in that business for two or three years minimum, you know, if you're serious. Um, so don't begin the patent process. Begin your your study of the marketplace, Paula. That would be my advice. Um, I want to thank Madeline for helping out with the, with the questions. Um, really appreciate that, Madeline. You did a great job. Uh, so, okay. So we're going to do this again. We're going to do it next Wednesday, same time, same place. Um, so put that on your calendar. You can just come back to go on YouTube, type in invent, right? TV, go to our homepage. You'll see the link to click on for the next live one. Um, we have, I talked to Mike Bowling and he did pound puppies and it made insane amounts of money. Insane back in the eighties. I'm 50 going on 51. Um, I remember Pound Puppies. Before that was Cabbage Patch and Dolls, and I worked in a toy store at the time. Uh, and I remember Pound Puppies. So it was really cool to talk to Mike today. And he's going to talk about um, his products, but he's going to have some lessons in there about um, – this is tomorrow night. And it's free for the public, guys. We're doing this during the virus epidemic or what have you. Um, he's going to talk about how creating relationships with companies served – individuals in companies is so important. And I'll leave you with this. When you reach out to 30 companies, 25 companies, it's not just about licensing that one product. It's your opportunity and your reason to establish a relationship with people so that when they aren't interested in that product, oh, no problem. Are you open to more? Oh yeah. Now you're back in there with another product. So that's a very rudimentary reason why it's very important to establish relationships with licensing. Mike's going to go into a lot more detail. So Stephen or other co-founder is going to be on tomorrow night. Um, what, what time is that, Madeline? I think it's, uh, let me take a look real quick. I think it's at five Pacific. Yeah, five to six Pacific. So five Pacific, six Mountain, seven Central. I feel like I'm on a TV station at <laughs> eight Eastern. So that's tomorrow night. Um, Madeline will put the link in the uh, yeah, same time as today, but tomorrow. You need to register for that, though. That's not on YouTube. So Madeline will put the link in the chat. 
she already did. I see it's a few up there. So I'll give you a second. I'm not going to ramble anymore. But if you want to register for that, and you're not registered for it, click the link in the chat right now. Because I think when we go not live, it takes a while for it to encode and then the recording to go up. And then you can see the chat. But I don't think you can go back and click on it. So I'm just going to give you two seconds to do that right now. Um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll just I'll say this in closing for give you guys a second to click on that link if you want to attend tomorrow night. I think we have we almost have a thousand people registered for that. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, what, I, what I'm going to say is is one thing that I've, I've I've noticed over the past 20 years is probably for 98 percent of you, you just started coming up with ideas one day. You didn't say I'm going to be an inventor. You, know, you just started coming up with ideas that just hit you one day, whether it was when you were a kid or whether it was, you know, a year ago. Um, it's part of who you are. And and people really enjoy coming up with ideas. But and some people, that's all they'll ever do. They'll just come up with ideas and they like dreaming about it and daydreaming about it. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But then a small percentage of you, I would say all of you, the fact that you're listening to this, the inventor that just wants to come up with ideas wouldn't listen to me ramble on all this boring business stuff that you need to know to license. So I would say that you guys are in the group, a very small group of people that come up with ideas that really want to work on them. So what I was going to say is that there's a point, and some of you might be there, some of you might not be there. There's a point at which it, it's now not fun anymore because you see product ideas you came up with come out in the marketplace and you start to get frustrated with it. And you're like, I'm tired of just dreaming up the stuff. I got to do something. And InventRight's all about that. We cater to people that are ready to jump in. You might be ready now. You might not be. I've talked to people that have known us for years before they decide to get our help or reach out. But if you don't get help from us, get help from somebody that really knows what they're talking about. And, and uh, we do a lot of free education, watch our YouTube show, do our free webinars, do a lot of free education. We do, we do coaching, we do a lot more than just educating. We hold your hand through it all. Um, so if you're interested, you can go on InventRight and check it out. So I remind everybody, take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See ya, bye.